I'm going to review some of the content and information from chapter one of interpersonal communications and the introduction of it. So let's go back a little bit. This is from the interplay book and the process of interpersonal communications. So starting off with why we communicate, the communication process, what makes communication interpersonal, and communication competency. Those are some of the main topics that will be covered. So everyone communicates from our earliest childhood, and we're essentially going to be doing that nonstop until, you know, the day that we die. It's unavoidable that we're going to be communicating with someone. And so these are some of the learning objectives that will be covered throughout the chapter. Uh, the outline is the needs that communication satisfies. It explains the interpersonal communication process and its transactional nature and the principles of it and the, along with its characteristics. We will describe the characteristics of interpersonal versus impersonal communication and also identify characteristics of effective communication and competent communicators. So first off, why do we communicate? What is the purpose? To meet physical needs. Our physical needs are affected by communication and the presence or absence of this will affect our physical health. Also, to a, our identity, our needs to identify who we are are met through communication, which is the principle and the way we learn who we are as humans. Our sense of identity comes through the way that we interact with others. Social needs are also met through how we communicate. It's the principal way that relationships are created. And some scholars even argue that communication is one of the primary goals of human existence. And then lastly, some of our practical needs. So our practical needs are met through communication because it serves as an important function. And examples of this could be functions related to the workplace and even outside of work. So an example could be if you're going to the doctor and you're sick and you're trying to tell them how you're sick and the symptoms of that, or if you got hurt and where it hurts and the pain scale that you are on, you know, one through 10 or the smiley face chart that they show you and you're trying to explain to them what level of pain that you have. Or if you go to get your hair cut and you're trying to tell the stylist uh, what style you want or what hair color that you want your hair to be dyed or how much hair to cut off. So those are all practical needs that we have to communicate to someone in that, you know, in a specific situation. I'm not going to show any of the videos uh, in the slides or and I'm not going to do any of the specific activities. These can all be done in class. And the same with some of these discussions. I'll, I might cover some of them a little bit, but these can be gone through in more detail in class discussions. So essentially, why we communicate, how are communication needs met differently in different types of relationships? In different types of relationships, whether it may be professional or personal, the type of relationship you have with your mom versus with your boss versus in a romantic relationship, all of those are going to vary and meet different type of communication needs. Let's go to the communication process. The communication process uh, is using messages to generate meaning, meaning in a calm, complex process and it involves many factors. The early models of communication were first created in the 1950s to capture this communication process. And it was a one-way linear model that was composed of a sender, a message, and a receiver. That's how it first began when they created it in the 1950s. But later, as the model started to evolve, they started to realized that that wasn't a true rep representation of how the communication process actually exists. 
the later models started to incorporate feedback and feedback means that there's a, a verbal or a nonverbal response to the message so that the person is responding it whether it's through their you know verbal or nonverbal way in a to that message communication theorists develop sophisticated transactional communication models in an attempt to depict all of the factors that affect human interaction and that's how we came up with a transactional communication model that's going to be depicted uh, on the next slide so this looks more complicated i think than it really is and so i'll go through this in more detail so the transactional communication model essentially means that sending and receiving messages when that is occurring it can be happening simultaneously so if i'm talking to you and you're talking to me back and forth and we're having a conversation that can be happening at the same time we you know it, it goes back and forth in both both ways the transactional communication model replaces the role of the sender and receiver with the term communicator because they say it is impossible to distinguish who is the sender and who is the receiver. And they also say that meaning exists in and among people. Messages, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, they don't have meaning in themselves because the meaning resides in the people who express and interpret them. So if you and I are having a conversation about something, the meaning is coming from you and I because we are interpreting what is happening and what is being said. Let's say a third person comes up, they may not understand what's what's happening in the conversation if they just walked up because they didn't know the context of the situation they don't you know they might interpret it differently maybe it's an inside joke an inside conversation and and it can be interpreted completely different also things that can affect the the conversation or what's occurring in the communication is the environment and the noise so the environment is the context uh in the fields of experience that help people make sense of other people's behavior so that could be the location that could be the person's experience and that could also be their cultural background so someone's culture it could influence how they interpret the message or their personal experiences and the same thing with the location that you're in and the noise could be anything that interferes with the transmission or the reception of the message so let's say that we are in a nightclub and we're trying to have a conversation and the music is super loud and you can't hear anything or you can only hear parts of the conversation that could completely change the meaning of the conversation or maybe you can only hear every other word so it could be very difficult to interpret what's being said throughout that conversation or maybe somebody keeps trying to walk up and interrupt you or maybe there's a child that's screaming in the background that could be something that would be interrupting the communication process so that would be external noise which would be a distraction and then psychological noise involves or physiological noise involves biological factors that interfere with reception and this psychological noise refers to cognitive factors that lessen the effectiveness of communication. So there's a lot of things that can happen while you're trying to communicate between someone and a lot of things that can interrupt this process to make it less or more effective. And it also can depend on the channel that you are communicating with someone are we talking in person are we talking through the phone technology can make a big difference in how well or effective something can be sent or received is your phone have bad service and so then the person can't hear you are you texting someone are you emailing them those are all different channels or and the medium through which the message is going to be ex exchanged 
Also, communication channels can be face-to-face -face or mediated. Mediated communication is sending or receiving messages through technological channels, such as the phone, email, or internet, which is what I was saying. Also, when you text someone or email them, people interpret those messages different. Have you ever texted someone and they were unintentionally offended by something that you sent to them? Or maybe you were trying to joke with them or be sarcastic, but they didn't interpret it that way because of how they read it, because they didn't hear your voice or they didn't when they read it, they interpreted it in a different way than you intended. So it, that can make a complete difference on how the message is sent as well. So insights from the transactional model are that the messages are being sent simultaneously and people are constantly sending and receiving messages back and forth. And that the meaning is translated among the people and that the communicator is the sender and the receiver and that the environment can make a difference, noise can impact that, and then the channels as well. And then the types of noise, like I mentioned uh, previously, external noise uh, that can include the different types of distraction that are outside the receiver that make it difficult to hear. The physiological noise is like biological factors that interfere with the reception or psychological noise can be cognitive factors that can limit the effectiveness. Now we're gonna go down and look at communication principles. So in addition to the insights of communication models, there are other principles that guide the understanding of communication. So communication is transactional. So what does that mean? Communication is a dynamic process that the participants create through their interaction with one another. Communication can also be intentional or unintentional. All behavior has communicate has communicative value. We cannot not communicate with each other. Also, another thing that not everybody always takes into consideration is communication is irreversible. So unfortunately, you might get mad, you might say something that you don't mean, but it was already said and you already communicated that and it can't be taken back. And so once you already, you know, did something that maybe you didn't want to say or that wasn't very nice because you were upset, these words cannot be retracted after they're already out there. And communication has, um, is unrepeated because the same words and behaviors may have different outcomes each time they were spoken and performed. And communication has a content and a relational dimension. The content dimension involves the information being explicitly discussed. The relational dimension expresses how you feel about the other person. These are some common misconceptions about communication, and you probably have heard people say these or talk about these before. Avoiding these common misconceptions may save you some issues in your personal life or in some instances that you run into. Not all communication seeks understanding. So what does that mean? It is a mistake to assume that the goal of all communication is to maximize understanding between the communicators. Social rituals that we have every day attempt to influence others. So example is um, you see TV commercials every day and a lot of times the point of a commercial is to persuade you to buy something uh, or you know to convince you it's advertisement that's the point of it. Uh, and so that's the type of communication in which understanding is not the primary goal. And so not all communication is just for understanding. So it's a mistake to assume that the goal is just to understand between communicators. 
Another common misconception about communication is that the more you communicate, the better that it's going to be or the better that it's going to make the situation. So excessive communication can be unproductive and it actually can sometimes make the problem even worse. There's times when no interaction may be the best option. So if the situation is already tense or maybe you're upset with somebody, it might be a better option to walk away or to just not talk to each other and kind of like give each other some space or time. I'm sure you might be able to think of a situation when you've been upset with someone or you've been arguing with someone or, or, or whatever it may be. And that person just kept talking and talking and, and, and talking about the situation, but it wasn't making it any better the more that they talked. And so that's where I'm saying the more you communicate doesn't mean that it's more likely to solve the problem in, the, in some situations. And that's kind of where we go into the next one. Communication will not solve all problems. Sometimes even the best timed and the best planned communication is not going to lead to a resolution for that issue. Is it good to communicate with people? Of course. <laughs> I mean, I'm teaching a communication course and I think effective communication is very important and it's something that we should all strive to improve on and you know, we have to communicate with people, but it doesn't mean that it's always going to solve a, a, that specific problem. And it doesn't mean it's going to solve all of your problems. And this is another common misconception. Effective communication is not a natural ability. It's not something that you just wake up knowing how to do. And I, this is also something that I talk about in my public speaking classes. Some people think that people are just born knowing how to do well at public speaking. Like they think that, oh, that person is just a, a really good public speaker naturally. They didn't have to try hard to know how to, you know, get over their fear of speaking in front of people. I don't think that that's true. I think that they just knew how to put themselves in that situation repetitively and they, practice repetitively to get better and to improve and learn how to communicate more effectively. And it's something that you can teach yourself and improve even if you are not great at it to begin with. And I think that communication is the same thing. Even if you're not naturally a confident communicator or sometimes it makes you feel uncomfortable or maybe you're more of an introvert person or a mix of an introvert and extrovert i think that you can still improve upon your communication skills and so that's definitely a misconception that i've heard from a lot of people or maybe if you struggle with communication among your relationships it is something that you can try to get better at and I do think it will make your relationships more successful if it's something that you're aware of. What makes communication interpersonal? What makes some types of communication interpersonal versus impersonal? So the number of people interacting can make a difference. And it also depends on the meaning of interpersonal. And it, the quality of the interacting. So the quantitative approach defines interpersonal communication by the number of the number of communicators. Social scientists call two people interacting a dyad. Qualitative approach means that people treat each other as two uni unique individuals. A qualitative approach defines the opposite of interpersonal as impersonal interaction. So characteristics of interpersonal communication are defined by four features that distinguish communication in highly interpersonal relationships from less personal ones. So the first one is uniqueness. The second is interdependence. The third is self-disclosure. Self and the fourth is intrinsic rewards.
So if you look at this scale right here, uh, this arrow scale, and it says uh, on one side, highly impersonal and highly interpersonal. And then underneath it, it has some examples of situations that would be highly impersonal versus highly interpersonal, like scheduling an appointment, answering a phone survey versus marriage proposal, asking for forgiveness. So interpersonal and impersonal communication are a matter of balance. All communication should not necessarily be interpersonal. The healthiest communication is a mixture of time together and apart between deeper and more superficial more superficial interactions. So you need alone time, but you also need high quality interpersonal communication. And I mean, because that's important, but it can take a lot of energy. And the time away from others can also be a way of recharging your emotional, you know, batteries and also gaining perspective in a relationship. I know that some people also need more alone time than others uh, because they feel like it's too much if they're with other people all the time. But personal and impersonal communication, most relationships are neither highly interpersonal nor highly impersonal. There is also an impersonal side to even the most important relationships. Interpersonal is like rich food, so too much of it can make you uncomfortable. But quality interpersonal communication is, is special because it can be very rare. So some of these discussion and activities we will go over in class, like I mentioned. So communication competence is defined as communication that is both effective and appropriate. So principles of communication competence. There is no single ideal or effective way to communicate. The de definition of what communication is appropriate in a given situation varies considerably from one context or cultural cu culture to another. Communication or competence is situational as communication competence functions to a to a particular degree or particular areas. Competence can be learned. To a great extent, competence is a set of skills that anyone can learn. So it's just like other things that we talked about. Communication competence isn't something that you just wake up and know how to do or that you're just a natural ability that some people are better at than others. I think that, yes, maybe some people might feel more competent or more comfortable in communicating at first but i think that if somebody tries and works at improving how they communicate and their competence in an area that they can get better at it and improve on how comfortable they feel so what are characteristics of competent communication so a large repertoire of skills um, and it increases the options for communication and the likelihood of achieving personal and relational goals. Adaptability that involves selecting appropriate responses for each situation and for each recipient. The ability to perform skillful, skillfully is important. Also empathy or perspective. Uh, so that's taking means more than just imagining another person's perspective. This could be vital to communicate that understanding through verbal and nonverbal responses. And then cognitive complexity is the ability to construct a variety of different frameworks when you are viewing an issue. So that basically means being able to look at other people's points of view, be open minded uh, when you're speaking with people about different topics and opinions. And then self-monitoring is the process of looking at your behavior and kind of evaluating it. So kind of being self-aware. So this is just kind of a, a review of the learning outcomes that we covered from the chapter. So that 
the needs that communication satisfies, the interpersonal communication process, that it's transactional, the governing principles and characteristics, and then the characteristics of impersonal versus impersonal communication, interpersonal versus impersonal, um, identify, identifying characteristics of effective communication and competent communicators. And then the this is just uh, some activities uh, that we may go over in class. So that is all of just the content for chapter one.